My name is Father John Paracone. I am a professor of philosophy in St. Francis College in Brooklyn, New York. And today we would like to consider, uh, after having considered in past lectures, whether or not human reason is able to conclude to a certain knowledge of the existence of God. Remember, whether human reason can conclude to this. Without the assistance of faith, 90% you know, of the people in the world who believe in God, believe in God based upon belonging to their religion. Uh, but it is necessary for Catholics to remember that the existence of God is not something that is known only by faith, though most do. It is something that can be proven by man's reason and man's reason alone. So let me give you an example. Man can demonstrate by looking at the world that God exists. That can be proven. But what cannot be proven, for instance, is that there are three persons in one God. That is a dogma of the Catholic faith. For that, it is absolutely necessary to have the divine gift of faith. That is an ascent of the intellect, you see. That something is true because God has said it, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. But when it comes to the intellect, being able to prove that God exists, it can do that. The First Vatican Council in the 19th century defined that. Or else, if God's existence were not able to be established, by man's reason, without the assistance of faith, then it very well might be considered that faith just builds itself in like sand castles in the air. No, God is as real as you are who are listening to me, as I am who are standing here. Now, we must also recall that after faith has accepted the truths that the church proposes, it recognizes that none of them contradict reason. That none of them are opposed to reason. But that is after they have been accepted. We spent time talking about how the intellect does that. And no one better in the history of human thought has established that fact more clearly than St. Thomas Aquinas, the great 13th century doctor of the church, whom I will remind you Mother Church has not only declared doctor, that is, expert in the teaching of the Church, but common doctor, doctor communis. What does that mean? You know, you've probably all heard the title angelic doctor. But that's not the most important one. The important one is common. It means that for every Catholic at all times and all places, he is the one amongst all the doctors that the Church goes to in order to see clarity about not only matters philosophical but matters theological. So at the Council of Trent there were two books that were placed on the altar of that cathedral where the Council Fathers met. It was the Bible and St. Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae. After we established that the intellect can see this with certitude that God exists and we did that with St. Thomas's help. And St. Thomas does that in five distinct and specific ways, uh, which we have covered in past lectures. The next question is this. Having established that God exists, can we say anything about God? Can we say anything about his nature? 
That's what we'd like to spend time doing today. Saying something about the nature of God. Now remember, in the course of these particular talks, we are asking the question, can, the human, can human reason alone come to a knowledge of God's existence? We answered yes. Now we're asking, can human reason alone, without the assistance of faith, having established that God exists, can we say something about the God who exists? There are two answers to that. St. Thomas answers, well, clearly we can say something about the nature of the God who exists, having established that he exists in reality. Because after all, when we know that something exists, we can say something about it from the effects that it produces. However, he, there is another point of view uh, that would say God is so separated from us that God in his perfection is there's such a gulf that separates us in our imperfection that the creator is so different than the creature that the creature, you and me, can say nothing about what God is. And that would have been the position of a, of a sixth century Christian philosopher whose name was Pseudo Dionysius. He wrote a book called On the Divine Names. And in that text, he went as far as to say that God is so much greater than us, he is so ineffable, that it would be disrespectful to say of God that he bears anything in common with us. He takes that position to an extreme, which we're not prepared to go into here, but it kind of ties him in philosophical knots. St. Thomas Aquinas no, no one recognized the ineffability of God more than Aquinas. But yet he recognized that God, because he exists, shares something in common with us who exist. What is that common denominator? Being. Existence. While we cannot know anything directly about God, while we cannot know anything directly about his nature, because we can never see God until, of course, we die and go to heaven, the beatific vision. We can definitely know something about God by virtue of looking at his effects. I could, some, I could know something about the parents of children by looking at the effects on how they raised those children. Even though I don't have a direct knowledge of the parents, I can know something about the children. By, by looking at the children, I can know something about the parents themselves. I can know something about the painter of a painting by looking at the kind of paintings he produced. I can know something about a director by the kind of movies he directed. You see, we can know something about the author by looking at his products. There's no, there's no different case with God himself. So St. Thomas has cleared up that problem. That while God, yes, is infinitely greater than us, we can still say something about God's nature by looking at his effects. That's us. That's anything that he has made. Remembering now, we're not relying on the virtue of, or the act of faith here. This is a complete philosophical task. If you recall, at the end of St. Thomas's Five Ways, those proofs for God's existence, the most fundamental thing that he said about God is this that he is pure act. I'm going to have to talk about that a moment. And the way we can do it is by doing what St. Thomas did. He looks at the book of Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, Moses, kneeling before the burning bush, asks God, after he tells Moses to go to Pharaoh to liberate the Jews, 
Moses asks, but whom shall I say sent me? And God answers Moses by saying, tell them I am who am sent you. That sounds like an odd name, isn't it? At least to our ears. But it truly is what God is. St. Thomas uses that as a jumping off point to guide all his discussions of God. I am who am. What God is saying is that his identity, like your identity, his identity is simply existence, simply being. And that means that the reason why God can't be called anything because there's nothing that limits his existence to being this thing or that thing. He rises above, he transcends all limits because he himself has no limit. He is pure existence. Now think about that. If he is pure being or existence, then he literally encompasses everything because outside of being, outside of existence, there's nothing. Thomas uses that as a way to step into speaking about what God must be like. The first perfection of God we would like to consider using that method is God's simplicity. Be careful about that word. As with so many words in philosophy, or the words that Thomas uses, or the words that the scholastics used of the Middle Ages, they sound the same, or they're identical to words we use in common parlance in our idiomatic conversation. When we say a person is simple, we're usually not saying that as a flattering term. So we have to be careful that when we're using it to talk about God, it means what St. Thomas meant it to mean. Simplicity in St. Thomas, all those scholastics of the Middle Ages, means having no parts. Having no parts whatsoever. Whereas complexity means having one or more, having more than one part. When we say that God is simple, we are saying two things. Not only does he not have a body, because to have a body clearly means to have limit. To have a body means I can only be here and nowhere else. We can't assign God, God a body if he has limits. Because that would, not, that would make him not God. But the second meaning is even more important. And we call that a metaphysical meaning. Each and everything that we see in creation is itself precisely because it has limit. You are who you are because you have a limit. The chair you're sitting in is itself because of its limit. What is being limited? Its existence. With God, there's no limit. So that category of limitation is removed. And once removed, it means that God as was told in the book of Exodus, is pure existence, is pure being, without any kind of limitation. So St. Thomas, from this first identity of God, this first name of God, pure act, I am who I am, is able to conclude that we can say of God that he is utter, absolute, and pure simplicity meaning that there are no parts in God. Clearly that he has no body, that's taken for granted. But he has no limitation even on the manner in which he exists. He is pure existence. He is utterly simple. From that first perfection of simplicity, St. Thomas is going to go on to talk about other perfections in God. The second one we want to talk about is the very term perfection. That God is all perfect. He is simple. He is all perfect. But what do we mean by this word perfection? Well, its root is in a Latin word, which means to make, to have.
have something be perfect means to have it be whole. To have it have everything it needs to be itself. To be perfect means to lack nothing. To lack nothing. It's quite easy to understand that God, and only God, can be said to be all perfect. Well, for instance, you have a perfection. You have many perfections, but every one of them are limited. Because God is pure being existence, He has everything with no limit, because there is no limit on His being. We've talked about simplicity, we've talked about perfection. Next time, I'll be getting together with you to talk about all the other perfections that exist in God. Thanks so much for joining me. We'll see you next time. Father Paracone here. Goodbye.